I'm Kathleen James Chakraborty. I'm Professor of Art History and Head of the UCD School of Art History and Cultural Policy. And I'm standing here in Newman House, which is one of the exemplars of 18th century architecture in Dublin, really of George in Dublin. George is the name of four successive English kings who ruled beginning in 1714 into the early 19th century. And the term is used to describe architecture of that period, but above all to describe the architecture in Dublin from the 1720s to the Act of Union at the end of the century. George in Dublin is above all a city of red and brown brick houses, of townhouses, row houses, whatever you want to call them, and of exceptional buildings that are faced in or actually built, as the Bank of Ireland is, out of stone. The enormous explosion in the scale of the city of Dublin at this period, if you think that the original city centre is around the two cathedrals, and today it's really centred on the Bank of Ireland, that's famously the biggest traffic knot in the city. And so the explosion in the scale of the city as it moves east in particular, north and south, but also in the quality of the construction, the permanence of the construction. Well, there's streets like Henrietta Street, and then of course there are the sequences of squares that really anchor people in the city, Mountjoy Square, Marion Square, squares that were originally the green space shared communally between these houses, and the streets that are generally relatively broad by European standards of the time, lined with what were usually at the time houses, although today many of them have become apartments, and of course in South Dublin most of them are now offices. <laughs> Generally speaking, the people who lived in these houses were wealthy people. Of course, they also had their servants with them, so there were many people of much more modest circumstances dwelling and working in these buildings on a daily basis. But the incentive, the impetus for the expansion of the scale of Dublin is partly the presence of the parliament here. And so many of these people would have had ties, perhaps at second or third remove, from the parliament. This is a prosperous period in the history of the city, and these houses were also filled with a new level of material culture. People in these houses were drinking tea, were drinking coffee, were carrying pocket watches, a an explosion in prosperity that's very different from the 17th century in Ireland, or indeed in most of the rest of Europe. In the 19th century, when Dublin is generally less prosperous and there are fewer people of means who are interested in living in this particular way, then many of these houses had very uh, sad histories. Many of them become tenements. Others, like the building we're standing in now, have very glorious histories. This becomes the building in which the Catholic University of Ireland is founded, the ancestor of UCD. This is a building that is inhabited by the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, but in many cases, these were basically slummed tenements. And I think this gave George and Dublin a very bad name, the pe associations people had with George and Dublin in the early 20th century, into the middle of the 20th century, are of poverty and of housing conditions that are well below uh, the standards for that Ireland aspired to and that wealthier parts of Europe in that period enjoyed. <laughs> One of the most salient features of George and Dublin is that many of the houses are very simple and plain from the outside. They're built of brick. And this itself was a move forward technologically. It was a move above all towards fire safety after the great fire in London. But when you get inside these houses, things change enormously. And Dublin is specifically, Dublin's Georgian houses are known, are noteworthy for the quality of their interiors. This, quality of the stucco work in particular. Stair halls as here are often moments of real celebration. You have to imagine everybody all dressed up, parading from the entrance up to the first floor where the main activities took place, dressed in all their most splendid finery for an evening party. And then this setting that you have here. Behind me is a Palladian or Surliano window, and above me are all kinds of stucco work, including musical instruments, violins, flutes, everything that speaks 
of the social rituals and ceremonies that were going to be held in spaces upstairs. One of the ways in which you see the vitality here in this stucco work are the birds that seem to be flying out almost to the ceiling. You see also birds cooing to each other, a mother bird perhaps feeding its baby. These kinds of detail that really delight you and that are original, although different houses have similar stucco work, a house like this would be different from its neighbors in this regard. And that meant that as you traveled from one house to the other through the, your social calendar of the year, you were endlessly delighted in new ways.